Hi, I'm Nitin Natarajan, Deputy Director here at CISA. It's great to be here with you today to help close out Infrastructure Security Month. Throughout this month, we've talked about how critical infrastructure security is to our national security and how we can work together in a partnership between the government and the private sector to protect our nation's critical infrastructure from both cyber and physical threats, both from Mother Nature as well as from cyber terrorists, criminal organizations, as well as nation state actors. With us here today, I have two of the nation's experts to have this dialogue. I have Manny Cancel, who serves as the Senior Vice President and the CEO of the Electricity Information Sharing and Analysis Center, or EISAC, which is a critical entity involved in information sharing and collaboration with the energy sector to help protect our nation's power grids throughout North America. Also have with us is Dr. David Mussington. Dr. Mussington serves as our Executive Assistant Director for our Infrastructure Security Division here at CISA, joined us last February, and is responsible for working with pri private sector partners, as well as state, local, and tribal and territorial governments to look at identifying and protecting our nation's critical infrastructure from a broad spectrum of threats. We'd like to talk to you today about both perspectives from the government and the private sector, but really where that comes together in our partnership and allowing uh, that collaboration to protect the nation. So with that, I'd like to start off by kicking the question over to Manny. What do you see as the government's role in supporting your efforts in the private sector to protect our nation's critical infrastructure? Well, first, uh, and thanks for uh, having me here today and, and appreciate uh, you and CIS's leadership in protecting critical infrastructure. But uh, look, the government's role is to make sure that we're aware of the threats that we're facing, even though we do have a, a fair amount of intelligence. But understanding the threats that the government is tracking, um, the government has a tremendous amount of programs and capabilities that I think we can take advantage of to help protect. Uh, it also helps in harmonizing across all the critical infrastructure sectors, right? I think you have the interesting perspective of seeing what's going on from all those sectors. And we do too, but maybe not to the extent that CISA does. And I think that collaboration is really critical in terms of, uh, you know, continuing to fight this battle. It's great. We know it is a complex battle. Yeah. And then we know a lot of the sectors are dependent on each other uh, for their success. So that collaboration is key uh, to all that we do. Absolutely. You know, and we, we uh, collaborate with all the critical infrastructure sectors. We recognize that, you know, uh, while electricity is one of the key critical infrastructure sectors, we're just as dependent on the other critical infrastructure sectors as well. So to the degree we maintain situational awareness, we talk about best practices for risk mitigation, it helps. Great. Thanks, Wayne. Dr. Bossington, I know we've done a lot in the and looking at our role here in CISA and looking across the critical infrastructure sectors and understanding dependencies and interdependencies. But what is it that you see the industry bringing to the table that makes your job easier or more successful? I think industry brings information and situational awareness on risks from their operational co uh, confrontation with those risks on a day-to-day -day basis so that we learn how industry works from the domain experts in, uh, in industry. We collaborate so much in terms of a deep partnership on risks, on best practices, many of which again come from the private sector. So industry, for profit industry, owns critical infrastructures, operates them on a daily basis, knows the most, so that we try and leverage that information together with our national security expertise to make the country more safe. That's, I think, the way the partnership works. It's not just large corporations or large parts of government, but we're seeing attacks against small rural school districts. We're seeing attacks against small businesses, ones further down the supply chain that might be what we like to consider uh, target rich and resource poor, right? Entities that, that don't have that ability to make that type of investment. What do you see as some of the challenges and ways in which industry can come together to help those entities as we look at really a vulnerability to one could result in a vulnerability to many or all? Yeah, so first I, I want to underscore what you said. We are absolutely seeing that, where, you know, we are seeing our adversaries, you know, trying to exploit what might be going on or take advantage, rather, uh, at those target-rich, resource uh, poor organizations, right? Because let's face it, the adversaries will take whatever entry point they can get in and maybe work their way up the chain. They are persistent and they are stealthy and they'll try to take advantage of that. But you know, to that end, and I think you know, one of the things we try to do in the electricity sector, and it is a diverse sector where you have uh, big investor-owned utilities, but you have small muni-run muni co-ops and, and utilities that way. And so working with them and making sure that they are sensitized to the threat landscape, right? 
uh, giving them help, right? So I can go back to last year where there was some ransomware incidents with small targeting smaller utilities. And in fact, the sector writ large got involved in terms of trying to protect. And then getting the word out of what those indicators of compromise were. The last thing I'll say, one of the uh, unique things the electricity sector has uh, we've not used it yet, but is this concept of mutual assistance, which we use physically during storms, right? Where crews from one part of the nation go to the other, to the affected part and help to restore the infrastructure there. Uh, we do the same thing now with cybersecurity, right? So resources from one utility could help others, right? And again, fortunately, we haven't been able, we haven't had to use this, but we have a, at least we have the framework in place so we can take advantage of that if necessary. That's great. We know the sector's done a lot of work in the physical space and be able to pulling that into the cyber arena is great. Yeah. I think, you know, our secret sauce is our people and uh, the protective security advisors and cybersecurity advisors that are based in our 10 regions that are approachable and through which we, we deploy programs at the regional level and the national level to meet the needs of particular, particular use of particular uh, resource challenged entities. And that's, that's how we can make the biggest direct difference, I think, with those who may not be expert in dealing with risks. Preventing people from being victimized and getting there right away in partnership with our interagency colleagues, uh, FEMA and others, especially post-disasters for recovery, um, is a key way that we can innovate on the product we provide, innovate um, to create new products to meet users and um, dependent communities where they are, um, and bring them along, again, building, building capacity so that they can exercise self-help. That's great, because we really know at the end of the day, everybody is a potential target, exactly. right? As we, as we look at the adversary, the number of adversaries, the capabilities, the adversaries continuing to evolve, then we see that target environment continuing to evolve as well. And it's really going to take all of us to work together to say one step ahead of that adversary in the years, in the months and years to come, especially in a very complex threat environment. I think that's right. I think that there are, you know, there's sort of a common, common observation that, quote, um, this is an offense dominant or attacker friendly environment. Um, it's attacker friendly right up to until the defenders are closely collaborating with each other, sharing information, sharing vulnerability information, and sharing best practices for mitigation. That removes some of those attacker act advantages, and it's our probably best, best hope for doing better in the future. Faster, more agile um, information sharing and collaborative protection, like the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative that we talk about in a different setting, um, that allows that experience of being victimized to be shared fast enough so that the next victim is more empowered. Another important aspect of that is drills, right? And, uh, you know, uh, many drills are facilitated uh, through the federal government. Um, in the electricity sector, we do a, grill every, a drill every two years that we call GRIDX that uh, not only includes the electricity sector, but we invite other critical infrastructure sectors in, water, chemical, telecommunications, natural gas. And again, recognizing that we are so interdependent. Uh, and those are very rich dialogues that really you know, uh, provide more food for thought, best practice sharing, uh, and those things need to continue as well. No, definitely. I've had an opportunity to participate in a few of them over the years, and it's been interesting and very eye-opening for people to better understand the electricity sector how it works, some of the myth versus the reality uh, of, of uh, how it works and some of the vulnerabilities that, they, that were perceived versus actual. Um, so any of these opportunities to continue to educate is also helpful as well. After all, if you take a, a mitigate, if you implement a mitigation, you want it to work. So you need to know that it works and have confidence that when someone gives you guidance and you follow it, you'll be better off. That, again, that value proposition of being better off after you want to take an action is central to what we're trying to do. Some of the things that we've looked at is how do we really build security and upfront, right? Whether we call it security by design, uh, whatever term we want to use, both I think in the cyberspace as well as in the physical security arena, uh, we look at opportunities that we could build that in in the beginning, right? Because I think at the end of the day that, that's most cost effective and allows us to really have that stronger security posture. So what are you seeing, Manny, in changes in industry and kind of where is industry going in the importance of security in their thinking and their planning for both new projects, but also as we talk about retrofitting and revitalizing old projects. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So uh, first, it, it is so critical, and particularly in the electricity sector, and see, I think you're seeing this happen right now, uh, as you see the deployment of renewable energy sources like solar and wind, which may not have the same security uh, measures or follow the same frameworks that some of the legacy infrastructure follows. 
um, you know, ideally you want to put that in ahead of time. You don't want to do that retrospectively, right? And the bad guys know that. They could take advantage of that, right? So I think working to sort of plan, at least in the electricity sector, the grid of the future and building security into the grid of the future, that's critical. But that extends to all the critical infrastructure sectors as well, too. As you know, when you think about uh, digitization, uh, new technologies that everybody's taking advantage of in all the infrastructure sectors, really need to think about how you implement them in a secure way. What are the things that industry would look for, would make it easier for industry to implement these types of measures up front? Well, I, I think it's understanding best practice. Dr. Mussington said it before, uh, you know, understanding the cost effective ways to do it and understand the risks that you really are protecting. Um, I mentioned earlier harmonizing things because I do think we can learn from each other and we do spend a lot of time collaborating and trying to learn from each other because everybody's got a slightly different take, but at the end of the day, we're still protecting uh, important things. Uh, working with our government partners on the right level of uh, incident reporting, I think, is critical. To the degree we keep the government informed about the things that we're seeing, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, I come from an organization and, and a sector that has reliability standards imposed on them. Uh, I'm not saying standards are a silver bullet by any measure, uh, and they're certainly not. But, you know, really getting ahead of it so maybe standards don't have to be, uh, you know, developed. But sometimes there is a time and a need for standards. And I think a combination of all these things, as you know, there's no one silver bullet, but all these things can kind of help in, in defending critical infrastructure. I mean, I think there's, uh, as we look at the 16 sectors, they're all diverse, they're all unique, uh, and they all face different challenges and, right. and a mix between the public and the private sector. And even though the private sector is not the private sector, right? You have uh, utilities that are more regulated than others, and we have a broad spectrum. So how do we solve these issues? Uh, you know, there's no single bullet, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, to solve all this. Great. Right. So, Dr. Musson, I'll turn it over to you as we look at, at the current investments that we're looking at doing across infrastructure across the nation, all right? Uh, how do we? How do you look at security by design? How do you look at the security up front, and how best some of this investment that's going to be happening nationwide can play into that? I think part of it is about um, sensitizing people to the impact of investments on the security and vulnerability exposure of critical assets and infrastructure. Uh, here, the electricity sector, as Manny said, leads because they do more science and R and D than many other parts of the U.S. economy, and they have a, a lot of engineers and engineering expertise that that translates into. Um, designing critical infrastructure that is more robust at the beginning. So both of you mentioned information sharing, and information sharing is something that is definitely near and dear to my heart. And I always say, you know, as we look at information sharing, we should look at how do we get the right information to the right people in a timely manner that results in more informed decision making. Um, so as we look at, at information sharing, where do you see ways that we can strengthen that information sharing um, across the public-private partnership? Well, um, first and foremost, it's, it's sort of, again, encouraging people to share information freely, sort of lowering the barriers for information sharing, right? And I said this before, um, the more we're aware, situationally aware across our sectors, the better off we'll be. Reporting requirements should be um, helpful, not necessarily punitive, right? They, they, they should really seek to help that. And the other thing, and I'm a big believer in this, is look, especially in the age of technology that we live in, the use of sensors that are monitoring what's going on in critical infrastructure networks I think is critical because that's sort of an easy, low-lift way of aggregating and analyzing data. And there are many programs across the federal government that, that do that. Uh, and so to the degree we, again, I, I probably overuse this word, harmonize those things and, um, and can understand what's happening across those sectors, tell a story of what we're seeing, and, and figuring out how we can protect ourselves, I think that's the opportunity in front of us. Okay. Harmonization is always a wonderful thing, and I think it's, it's something as we look at, at government, we always strive to do more of, and I think it's always something we could, uh, there's always more we can do in that space. And then if I may, I, I want to go back to something you just said about the government sharing information. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the government's done a great job, particularly over the last year, when you think about what we've had to face, you know, the, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, critical vulnerabilities that seem to come out every day, the election security concerns, right? I think CISA and the other sector risk management organizations have done a great job in terms of sensitizing the industry, getting information out, and, and helping us understand the risk from that perspective. Well, if I can just make a point on the automated information sharing that you, that you mentioned, that is, and the sensors in critical infrastructures, that is a, a key area um, that's it's probably going to dominate a lot of the information sharing debate, at least probably should, 
in that sort of way because it's it's objective, um, it's based in fact, it's based in the risk experience of the private sector, which is really what CISA depends on to, to be able to speak authoritatively about risk conditions. Yeah, I think, you know, it was great to hear the reference of risk mitigation as well, because I think, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about risk identification. We spend a lot of time talking about risk mitigation. But there's a third leg of the stool that I often tell people is risk acceptance. Mm -hmm. And any risk we've identified and not mitigated. I want to pivot slightly and talk a little bit about uh, something we're all dependent upon, which is a workforce and, and, and making sure we have that talented generation of workforce. And I've talked to you, critical infrastructure owners and operators in different sectors. And, and one thing I've heard pretty consistently across the board, whether these are in urban systems, in large systems, or in small rural systems, is a concern about the, the next generation of the workforce and making sure that we are, are creating that pipeline uh, to keep operators in, in place as we go forward. What are you seeing as some of the, the strong practices out there in industry to help keep that, that pipeline going in the years to come? And as you know, um, demand is outstripping supply. I think you know, companies have to um, reach out in their communities and sort of build that up. Um, you know, when I joined the energy sector, which was almost 40 years ago, you know, it was thought of a pretty uh, slow place, you know, to, to work. You know, uh, now I think that you couldn't be, have a cooler place, whether it's in the security space or in just in, in the building, the next generation of, 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 of grid systems. That's a great point. I think, I don't know whether people truly appreciate or understand what opportunities are out there. And, and frankly, you know, what pathways exist and, and both traditional pathways as well as non-traditional pathways um, that get people to uh, to where they are throughout their career. But we know there's there's definitely, as you mentioned, um, you know, the demand is, is outstripping the supply and it's something we need to continue to invigorate this next generation to. Yeah, you know, and I think that, um, you know, recently um, was, was talking to people in the computer science department at Howard University, that there's great interest, um, a desire to know more about the opportunity. So I think our our biggest challenge is probably outreach to all those that are interested from whom we can benefit if there's fuller participation across the, the different communities of America. And I think that that's uh, maybe a bit of an open door if we can get ourselves organized, but we are getting organized. So reaching out to communities that maybe aren't as knowledgeable about um, the requirements for cybersecurity and the opportunities that creates for them educationally and in terms of, of um, communities. I also think that, you know, we're a big country and making sure that everyone um, is aware and has a playbook, if you like, so that they can go pursue information either from CISA.gov, the services we provide, or from people who have established links with us uh, through critical infrastructures like the EI, ISAC, or others. So we talked a little bit about the workforce. We talked a little bit about uh, the threats and challenges, about the partnership. But what do you see as some of those larger challenges in the next five to 10 years? Um, boy, I think for, the largest challenge, I think, is that the threat is a bit unbounded. Threat actor ability to exploit critical infrastructure is something that defenses haven't really caught up with as much as we might have hoped. So that, it, in a sense, it's a, it's a stretch objective, keeping up with where threat actor virtuosity and agility might go. Um, that means that um, we have to deal with that uncertainty um, as, a, as a big stretch challenge, not only because it's individual actors, but peer actors who are well-resourced, who know the shape of the ecosystem. Well, that's a great point. I think we've always talked about the days of it was just a nation state threat, and that was almost easier in the sense of, of uh, that engagement. But what we're seeing today is not just nation states, but we're seeing cyber terrorist organizations, cyber criminal organizations. And mergers and, among them. And mergers among them. And even in the ransomware space now, ransomware is a service where you at least, in the past, you needed to have, build technical acumen or hire technical acumen and combine that with an enemy to conduct. Now you don't even need that. Now you just need, you know, you need currency, you need money, and That's you right. need an enemy, <laughs> and you can hire somebody to do it for you, which, which makes it even easier for people to become bad actors. So given that kind of landscape and, and those challenges, and, and you're now fighting not just one front, but three fronts, or 50 fronts, or 100 fronts, um, what, when you think about the next five or 10 years, man, what, what concerns you and your industry colleagues the most? Yeah, I think the doctor described it aptly. Unbounded is the best way to describe the, the threat landscape. Um, you know, so whether it's from nation state ad adversaries or criminal organizations um, or even physical security concerns, right? Um, those are all things that we have to pay attention to. So, um, you know, I think that's going, going to continue. That's not going away. And, and we know that and we have to continue to prepare for it. I think I'd go back to something you said before is uh, risk acceptance too, right? Very hard to sort of 
cover everything, but there are big things we have to cover, right? And so the lights going out in New York City is not something we can tolerate, right, due to a cyber attack, right? When you think about the potential socioeconomic uh, catastrophe that that would be, right, uh, and the impact on other critical infrastructure sectors, we really have to make sure that we uh, you know, protect those things as well as we go forward. So again, it's, it's a, the one other thing that though gives me hope here is, you know, um, cybersecurity programs in particular are, are fairly consistent, right? There are well-recognized frameworks and standards that exist that apply across that whole threat landscape and it will help to protect you. And, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna consider this a done battle, but I think a lot of the investments that uh, not only the electricity sector, but other critical infrastructure sectors have made, have actually served us well, particularly over the last year. And that has to continue. That was a great point, I think. And you mentioned physical security and cybersecurity and looking at that overlap. And I think, you know, as we go back over the last 20 years, that overlap in that Venn diagram gets more and more, right? As we introduce new technology, new capabilities, we're also introducing new vulnerabilities. Uh, into our service. And, and while those technologies are great enhancements uh, and make our lives easier, they also introduce a certain amount of additional vulnerability we have to mitigate against as we go forward. And I think that Venn diagram is going to continue to increase as we put more and more devices um, you know, on the internet, as we look at more, de more dependence on SCADA and industrial control systems and others. So it's going to be interesting to see kind of where this goes uh, in the future. We'll kick over to Dr. Mussington. And uh, you know, as we've, we've talked a lot of ground, talking about vulnerabilities, about the workforce, about threats and risks, and, and really what we're looking at the next five to 10 years. Um, is there anything else you want to add that we may have not touched on? Um, I think that it's important that we empower our citizens, our customers, our stakeholders with as much information as possible so that they can exercise some self-help. Security isn't something someone does for you. It's something that you're involved in creating and, and, and preserving. So I think that you know, capacity building at the state level, state, local, territorial, and tribal, making sure that um, private sector and states and other communities where the private sector resides are as capable as possible so that we can be catalytic in the way we, we provide contri contributions to security, not replacements. With this being a team sport, we're all in this together, and it's not as if we can be secure separately. So just capacity building more broadly, I think, is how, what I'd emphasize. That's a great point. As we talk about people, you know, being well informed to make their decisions, right? And whether this is you in a professional position in a company or in government deciding what hardware, or software you're going to buy, or what physical defenses you're going to put up in front of a building, or whether you're an individual saying, "I'm going to look for a new bank," and do I choose a bank that uses multi-factor authentication or one that doesn't? You know, recognizing things such as MFA makes such a big difference, uh, and really empowering and and helping enlighten those individuals to make those decisions, both professionally and personally. I think really is key. Man, is there anything you'd like our viewers to, to think about or, or to walk away with that we haven't covered yet? Well, I think it's things that we've said before. It is a team sport. It is uh, thinking about, do you have your risks adequately covered given the, the complexity of the threat landscape? It's about sharing information, reaching out, asking for help when you need it as well too. Uh, making sure that you're aware of the resources that do exist at the government level uh, and also at the state level uh, as well and, and local. Um, I think those things are, are, are really important. And going back to what Dr. Mussington just said, you know, everybody has a role in this, including, you know, John Q. Public, right, in terms of protecting and understanding what the risk is. And, uh, you know, helping policymakers make good decisions about how we should invest and protect going forward. Great, and, and it truly is, a, it's a group effort. Right? As you mentioned, we've heard it's about the individual, it's about our state, local, tribal, territorial partners, it's about our private sector partners, it's academia, nonprofits, as well as our global partners, because we know that this isn't uh, isolated here within the United States, but our dependence is on our, on our neighbors uh, throughout the globe and making sure that we're working together uh, to address this in a holistic manner. So I appreciate your time today and your experience and expertise. And um, we, you know, it's something that we know we're going to continue uh, to work together to tackle this immense challenge. I'd like to say if it were easy, it would be done by now. Um, but we know that it's really going to take all of us working together to stay one step ahead of the adversary. Uh, but together we can do it. And we're excited about what the future is going to hold. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.